Okay, I think we are very, uh, so uh, I, I'll take a minute just to uh, introduce my panelists to, to Dr. Tham because they're all very prestigious people. Uh, we have Dr. Manish Shah, who's one of the top surgeons in Bombay, one of the primary glaucoma surgeons, but he doesn't leave any cataract or anything else also. <laughs> and so Hello, Dr. Dr. Manish. Uh, Dr. Prateep Vyas is uh, a director of glaucoma services in Center for Sight in Indore. Uh, it is in the middle of the country and uh, he is also a wonderful, wonderful surgeon who does all complicated surgeries. Hello, He's Dr. Finished. Prateep. We have Dr. Shushmita Kaushik, who is uh, who's one of the professors in uh, uh, PGI Chandigarh and uh, she is uh, very passionate about pediatric glaucoma. Hello, then, Dr. Kashik. Hello. Uh, then we have Dr. Sunita Dubey, who's the MS and uh, Director of Glaucoma Services in uh, uh, Shroff Charitable Eye Hospital in New Delhi. And she also does all the complex surgeries. Uh, uh, and a uh, lot of MIGs and all she has also started doing. Hello, Dr. Dubey. And we have Dr. Parul Soni, who's... Uh, uh, who is a very, very good surgeon, both for glaucoma and cataract, and uh, she has a wonderful clinic, which is worth seeing. And uh, we have uh, well, Rithika, Rithika who is uh, uh, actually uh, administrative, plus she is a wonderful cataract surgeon and a cornea surgeon. So Hello, she, Dr. Rithika. Our talk would be on uh, how uh, about teleconsultations and all because that has become a big thing after COVID. So, uh, Zubi, can you go on to the yes, sir. Yeah, introduction that, slide? Yes, sir. So, we are very, very lucky to have Dr. Clement. And as Manish himself said, he's, he's a world authority in, on, on which we had already asked him questions. But he's uh, basically in the, he's a professor in the Chinese hospital uh, in Hong Kong. In, uh, and he is not only that, but he is so many other things. He's the chair of scientific program committee in the inaugural Asia Pacific Glaucoma Congress. And uh, he is heading a lot of organizations. And I just read up is this thing. He's a member of the board of governors of World Glaucoma Association. And he's the secretary and CEO of APAO. So he, and he has tremendous number of publications and awards. So I think more important for us is to listen to him. So uh, Dr. Tam, we'll be lucky to have you here. Please go ahead, sir. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Clement Tam from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Before I begin, let me thank Dr. Partha Biswas and others, also the scientific committee of the All India Ophthalmological Society for allowing me this privilege and honor to share with you some of my ideas on the management of primary angle closure disease with all of you. Now, first of all, these are my financial disclosures, and then also some of the government funding that has supported our PACG work. Now, first of all, the word primary, in primary angle closure disease, I think in a way it is misleading. Thus, the word primary often implies that this is one single disease entity. It implies that there is perhaps one management approach. And also, it may imply that there's no underlying cause or mechanism that is known. But however, in primary angle closure disease, actually, we are aware of several possible mechanisms that lead to angle closure. And these include pupil block, plateau iris syndrome, perhaps a lens-related mechanism, and also possibly choroidal pressures. Now, very often, whether in research or in clinical practice, we all often lump all primary angle closure disease into this one single entity. For example, in research studies, we will just randomize a whole spectrum of primary angle closure disease into receiving different treatments. Now, let me try to draw an analogy here, which is the red eye RCT. Suppose if we come up with a randomized controlled trial that looks at the treatment for red eyes, and I do not care about the underlying cause of the red eye. I don't care whether it is autoimmune, whether it is uveitis, or whether it is infective, but I recruit all cases of red eyes and then randomize these red eyes into receiving either topical steroid or, or uh, topical antibiotics. And at the end of the day, 
I say that amongst those eyes receiving topical steroid, the perhaps the improvement in the redness is significantly faster than those receiving topical antibiotics. And so I concluded that all red eyes should receive topical steroid. Does this make sense? Is this logical? I don't think so. I, I think management of diseases, including primary angle closure disease, should be based whenever possible on the underlying mechanism that is most important for that particular situation, for that particular individual and that particular eye. Now, in, with this figure here, I'm trying to, to show you the contribution of the different mechanisms of angle closure in different eyes. You can see that this column, the height of the column represents the anatomical predisposition to angle closure. So the higher the column, the greater is the risk of development of angle closure. And you can see that in different eyes, the predisposition varies in severity. And also in different eyes, the different mechanisms leading to angle closure also differs in proportion. Say for example, in eye number three here, it seems that plateau iris is the main mechanism leading to angle closure. Whereas in eye number four, perhaps the lens thickness is the main mechanism leading to angle closure. Now this figure here looks very similar, but this time this, in this graph, it is actually the same eye of the same patient, but going through different ages. You can see that with increasing age, the risk of anatomical angle closure increases. And also with increasing age, the importance of lens thickness as well as pupil block increases. So I think in the very first step of management of cases of angle closure, the objective is perhaps to remove the greatest chunk from this risk column by selecting one procedure or a combination of procedures that, that, that is most effective but at the same time carries the least risk. Now, in the next two slides, I'm going to share with you two hypothetical situations, which are at the two extreme ends of the angle closure treatment spectrum. In the first situation, we have a hypothetical 360 degrees complete appositional angle closure with ocular hypertension with or without glaucomatous optic neuropathy. In this situation, if there is visually significant cataract, then we perform cataract extraction. If there is still persistent appositional angle closure with plateau iris syndrome, then we consider argon laser peripheral erythroplasty. Whereas on the other hand, if there is no visually significant cataract, we may start with laser peripheral iridotomy. If there is still persistent appositional angle closure with ocular hypertension afterwards, then we would have to decide whether the plateau iris syndrome or the lens is the main mechanism leading to angle closure and then treat accordingly. Now in the second hypothetical situation, we have a 360 degrees complete sinecule angle closure. Now in this situation, even if you have done something such as cataract extraction to deepen the anterior chamber, chances are that the trabecular meshwork is still not accessible for aqueous drainage because of the sinecule angle closure. So in this situation, if there is visually significant cataract, we remove the cataract with or without another IOP lowering surgery. If there is no visually significant cataract, then we would have to decide how important the lens is in contributing to angle closure. If it is very important, we consider clear lens extraction with or without another IOP lowering surgery. Whereas if the lens is deemed not so significant, then we would consider one of these other IOP lowering surgery for this particular patient. Now you can see that with this management algorithm, very often we have to decide between plateau iris or the lens being the main contributing mechanism. And let me share with you some possible ways we can distinguish between these two. I think the most important evidence supporting plateau iris syndrome comes from either darkroom gonioscopy or ultrasound bile microscopy. So with darkroom gonioscopy, you can see that, for example, in this particular eye, just by putting on the gonioscope, you do not see any angle structures. 
So the next step, you would have to do indentation to see whether this is sinecule or appositional angle closure. Now, after indentation, the angle reopens, and so this eye has appositional angle closure. We can see that now the trabecular meshwork is revealed, but there's one additional sign you can see from this photograph, which is what we call the double hump sign, which is classical of cases with plateau iris syndrome. You can see that um, the iris, there's first hump over here, which is the iris draping over the very prominent anterior surface of a thick lens. And then the iris dipped downwards, creating a valley. And then the iris rising up again over a very prominent and anteriorly positioned ciliary body and processes uh, uh, complex. So you can see this double hump, which is a very good sign indicating plateau iris syndrome. Apart from darkroom corneoscopy, you, you can also use ultrasound bar microscopy to look at a cross section of the very prominent ciliary body and process uh, com com uh, complex, which pushes the peripheral iris, narrowing the drainage angle. And when the eye is in a, a dark situation with the pupil more dilated, the angle is then closed off completely. Now, there are, of course, also evidence that supported lens being the main mechanism. Of course, you can do all these measurements, but perhaps the most important sign is a very shallow central anterior chamber death, which is the re combined result of both the lens thickness as well as the, as the anterior posterior position of the lens. Apart from the central anterior chamber death, another very important sign is what I would call the Mount Fujiyama sign. You can see that when we are looking from an angle at the anterior surface of the iris, the pupil and the lens surface in an eye, uh, with the lens being the main mechanism of angle closure, it does take on the appearance of a volcano. This is because of the thickness of the lens as well as the anterior, a very anterior position of the lens. And so the iris is being draped over this prominent anterior lens surface, creating the appearance of a volcano. So thank you very much again for your time. If you're interested in more contents on glaucoma or perhaps on other areas of ophthalmology, please do take note of our first ever virtual APAO Congress in the year 2021, this year, which will be held from the 5th to the 11th of September. I very much look forward to seeing many of you at our first, first ever virtual Congress. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Tham. I think that was wonderfully done, so clear. And does anybody in the panel have a question for him? Anybody, Dr. Pratip? I would like to ask Dr. Tham, is that when you do the anterior chamber, either on the anterior segment OCT or on a, on a biometer, do you have a critical depth beyond which you would prefer to do the lens extraction? Uh, no, not yet. I'm afraid right now we do not have uh, very clear scientific evidence as to how shallow the anterior chamber is before we pr proceed to surgery. Um, there was a previous paper by the Singaporean group which studied Mongolian patients. And in that particular study, I think they identified a particular threshold, but that was not repeated in other ethnic groups. Right now, what we are trying to do is we are trying to do uh, an analysis of all the lens extraction in PACGIs that we have done to see if there is a threshold value. But um, we, ha we haven't done the detailed analysis of the data yet, but so far it, it does appear that there's not a clear threshold value, but it appears that the shallower the anterior chamber is, the greater is the effect on IOP reduction. Of course, one other extremely important um, um, uh, predictor of how much IOP lowering is, is the preoperative intraocular pressure. So right now, I'm afraid we don't have a very clear cut threshold, but it does appear that the central anterior chamber death is important. And Dr. Pam, how long does your iridoplasties work? Um, we, previously, we have done a retrospective analysis of 23 cases. And in that particular study, we have follow-up of up to, if I remember correctly, about 80 something to 90 months after the procedure. And amongst those eyes, only a few of them required a repeat of the iridoplasty. But in the vast majority of eyes, the, the effect of the iridoplasty on maintaining the open of, 
openness of the angle has remained throughout that period of follow-up. Thank you very much because I'm a very big fan of aridoplasty. I keep promoting it in India, but <laughs> I needed somebody like you to say that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I have one question. Can I ask? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so uh, in chronically uh, closed angle with cataract, you mentioned that you will combine cataract surgery with one of the glaucoma procedures. Mm -hmm. So how do you decide which procedure, whether it is trabeculectomy or mix or any other procedure? Yes, thank you very much for this question. In fact, I have my own lens extraction treatment spectrum. But of course, I understand that different surgeons may have different preferences. Uh, but for myself, I have my own lens ex treatment extra extraction spectrum. And my spectrum, on say for, for on the left-hand side, when I do not need a large amount of IOP reduction, then I perform phaco emulsification alone. If I need more IOP reduction, and both I myself and the patient is willing to accept a little bit more risk, then I proceed to combine phaco endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, photo ECP. If I need further IOP reduction uh, uh, and also able to accept even higher surgical risk, more invasiveness, as well as more surgical time, then I proceed to phaco trabeculectomy. Uh, in, in fact, we, we've done uh, randomized controlled trials uh, several randomized control trials to look at the effects of these three different procedures. And, and the, in reality, all these procedures, they lie along a spectrum with increasing effectiveness in IOP lowering, increasing reduction of uh, requirement for glaucoma drugs, but of course also with increasing surgical time, increasing invasiveness, and also increasing risk of complications. So this is my own personal Lens, treat, lens extraction treatment spectrum, but I'm, of course, different surgeons may have different pr preferences along this spectrum. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we are really honored to have you here with us and for clarifying so many thoughts. We'll proceed with our symposium. And I, at the outset itself, I want to uh, tell everybody that none of my panelists have any interest, any financial interest, because we are going to discuss how our local ophthalmologist can buy instrumentation and which instrumentation they should use. And we roll off with uh, Dr. Sunita Dube, who will be telling us uh, uh, which uh, tonometers, uh, which and why about tonometers. Please, Sunita, go ahead. Thank you. OK, so. Uh... You can see my screen. Yeah, fine, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Harsh, uh, for inviting me for this course. So which tonometer to use? As we know, IOP is the only modifiable risk factor in the management of glaucoma. So there is a need for accurate and reproducible measurement of IOP. There are numerous tonometers available in the market. Uh, therefore, it's difficult to make a choice and find a clear balance between cost effectiveness and reliability of a tonometer. An ideal tonometer is, which should give accurate and reasonable IOP measurement, which is easy to use, simple to calibrate, easy to standardize, and which is free from maintenance problems. So most commonly used uh, uh, tonometers in practice are uh, these. Uh, so I'm going to discuss them one by one. As we know that Goldman Applination Tonometer is the gold standard in measuring IOP, and it's a strit lamp mounted tonometer and records IOP in sitting position, therefore limiting its use in general anesthesia patients. It's, it has a learning curve and requires a trained person to perform the procedure. Its use in screening a large population is limited uh, because of the obvious reason that it is slit lamp mounted and IOP reading is affected by central corneal thickness. So it should always be um, associated with central corneal thickness measurement and uh, refractive power of the patient. Uh, as far as cost is concerned, it is uh, 45,000 to 75,000 rupees, so uh, expensive. However, maintenance is easy, and one should regularly check the tips of the prism for damage and cracks and change it when necessary, especially when we are frequently dipping it into sodium hypochlorite solution for disinfection during COVID times. So uh, dis disinfection in between patients is done by 70% isopropyl alcohol wipes, uh, at the tip of the prism for 10 seconds. However, it doesn't um, remove the adenovirus. Uh, it does disinfect against the COVID virus. So it's the high level disinfection is achieved 
by soaking the prisms for five to 10 minutes in one is to 10 dilution of sodium hypochlorite or 3% sodium, uh, uh, sodium peroxide. Calibration should be done monthly. Um, and if any error is detected, it should be sent to company for repair. Parkins tonometer is applanation tonometer, which is portable. Therefore, it is useful in children and anesthetized patients. And it has a built-in LED illumination that produces enhanced image of tonometer Myers. But I would say that it has a learning curve because whenever you're measuring the IOP, your hand may not be stable and uh, the illumination area is also small as compared to the slit lamp mounted applanation tonometer. And the cost is approximately one lakh. Now coming to Shor's tonometer, uh, we know it's an indentation and high displaci uh, displaceable type of tonometer. It is inexpensive, simple to use and durable and requires very little maintenance. And it is still used in our community screening programs and uh, however, we should know the limitation that the reading can be influenced by scleral rigidity. So differential tonometer should, uh, tonometry should be performed uh, to get rid of the problem of ocular rigidity. So studies have recommended it as a reliable screening tool in community outreach services, but abnormal IOP must be further subjected to GAT. And we should know that studies suggest that underestimates the pressure uh, in higher range and overestimates the pressure in lower ranges. Cost, as I said, is very, very reasonable and uh, calibration is easy and can be done uh, at the beginning of the day. Uh, amongst general ophthalmologists, non-contact tonometer is the most commonly used tonometer and it uses jet of air to applinate anterior corneal surface. It's a non-invasive method, does not require topical anesthesia, and a minimum of three readings average to estimate the mean IOP. So biggest advantage is that it can be used by a technician. I'm going to discuss about the aerosol generation with this particular procedure, and it can be available as table mounted or handheld portable. So it is reliable. Um, within normal range, and that is why it is useful for screening purposes. However, it may underestimate IOP at higher ranges and overestimate IOP at lower ranges as compared to GAD. And the mean difference between the two methods is approximately 2.72. Corneal thickness has greater influence on NCT than on GAD, and it is influenced more, even more in glaucomatous eyes with corneal thickness. The cost is approximately 3.8. Now the recent one is rebound tonometer. Uh, it's a contact tonometer with a very lightweight probe. And it just makes a very momentary contact with the cornea. Therefore, anesthesia is not required. And it takes six readings and highest and lowest readings are discarded on its own, giving a digital display of the average IOP. However, uh, uh, disposable probes have to be used for every patient to minimize the risk of dis, uh, to dis, uh, minimize the risk of infection. So it is necessary to change the uh, the disposable probe with uh, for every patient, especially during COVID times. So these are the different models which are available, and uh, uh, it can be performed in supine position for children in for, with eye care probe. Uh, tonometer and the home tonometry can also be performed with this particular uh, model. So uh, rebound tonometer gives reading slightly higher than uh, Goldman applanation plus minus three. And uh, again, it is influenced by central corneal thickness. And uh, this is the cost of the tonometer. Uh, tonopen, um, uh, we used to use it very often earlier before we had rebound tonometry. And now the latest version is Tonopen Avia, which is four, uh, four times, it has extra battery, does not require daily calibration and larger uh, LCD display. And uh, it is portable again, can be used for children and it can also be used on scarred cornea and through bandage contact lens. Um, however, again, it has this Ocufilm tip cover, which has to be changed with every patient. So again, it is expensive and uh, you can calibrate it in the beginning of the day. And again, 
it tends to overestimate the low IOP and underestimate the high IOP. And uh, uh, the, uh, the difference between the two is approximately three millimeter. And uh, some studies suggest that there is not much difference. Again, tonopen overestimates GAT values in thicker corneas. So it is affected by um, corneal thickness. And uh, so the cost is uh, 2 to 2.5 lakhs, but additional cost of octofilms. So when you compare all these tonometers, um, uh, GAT is the gold standard we know. And uh, uh, however, the maintenance cost would be high for the tonopen and IK tonometer because of these disposable probes and uh, octofilm. And uh, uh, it, uh, except uh, GAT, which is slit lamp mounted, uh, most of these tonometers can be used for screening purposes, although they are not very cost effective in case of tonopen and uh, eye care. And uh, risk of infection, we are just going to discuss and how to, um, how to disinfect them. So uh, currently there's published evidence of COVID-19 transmission through tonometry. However, um, studies have suggested uh, that Theoretically, there can be a risk because of this ACE2 expression in cornea and conjunctiva. Therefore, we need to urge on the side of caution while measuring the intraocular pressure. This was in uh, this study, this review was um, done in uh, 2020. And that time they uh, advised against the use of air cuff tonometry and pneumotonometry and rest all could be used with proper disinfection. However, recent thoughts about NCT is that it is highly unlikely that micro aerosolization that occurs during NCT would cause transmission of infection to a healthy person. Possible amount of aerosolization is negligible, especially when no topical drops are used because the tear film volume is very small. And if at all you have to use NCT, it should be placed in a relatively well ventilated room with sufficient circulation of ambient air and air flow exchange and increasing the interval between the two tests and with, of course, with limited staff for wearing masks. So it will further reduce the generation and accumulation of aerosol particles. And the last slide that uh, it depends uh, what kind of practice you have, whether you have a community setup or a glaucoma clinic. So I would advise that for glaucoma clinic, you need to have a tonometer, which is highly accurate, and you need to find a balance between cost effectiveness and accuracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sunita. That was a wonderfully done talk. And uh, uh, one quick question, if somebody asks you, I have an NCT, but I want to buy a rebound, should I buy a rebound or an applanation? Which one will you choose? Quick. Applanation. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. So let's go on to the next. And Shushmita is going to tell us which gonioscope to buy, why, which one is useful. Please go ahead, Shushmita. Thank you very much, sir. At the outset, uh, pleasure to be on the course, as always. Um, are the slides visible now? Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Okay, I'll just make it full screen. Right. So Dr. Hush posed this this question and I for a minute wondered how should it matter? Then you really had to think. So uh, one, two, three, or four mirror. So of course we know why gonioscopy. I thought I'd just do a quick thing of uh, what happens is like a fiber optic cable, the light uh, goes. Uh, hits the cornea and goes right back. So to see that, you need to increase this, this critical angle and you make the ray of light go out and either you use a gonio prism or, or you use a gonio mirror. So why would it be required? Of course, to visualize, to assess anterior chamber depth. Of course, you could see historical evidence of angle closure, such as sinechae. And uh, to classify the glaucoma, to note extent of neovascularization, any recessions after trauma, and evidence of any neoplastic activity. So these are the types we've talked about, the direct and the indirect. So whether or not you wish, wish to buy. So the most commonly used in the clinic is the indirect gonial lenses, because the direct gonial lenses, you could do it, but it was so cumbersome once upon a time. You needed a handheld slit lamp and a separate light source that most people are just using and indirect now, and the direct lenses are coming into fashion with the uh, advent of MIGs, and they're mainly used for surgery. So the main that you have is a three mirror gonio lens. You have one and two mirrors as well. But I think we'll talk about the three mirror gonio lens versus 
the zeiss or the posna or the indentation type of lenses so in the clinic really you have a choice between the scleral gondelman type of lens or an indentation or a zeiss or a posna lens and the major differences are a gondelman has a 12 mm diameter with a radius of curvature of 17 mm a coupling fluid is required and indentation is not possible because it rests on the sclera the rim of the the gonioscope rests on the sclera whereas the indentation gonioscopy have smaller diameter lenses no coupling fluid is required and the tear film fills the anterior surface but indentation is possible and we'll just go through what that means so which of these would you like to do now to see the angle any of them are fine but goldman the pluses are they're technically it's a larger lens but it sits on the sclera it's technically easier doesn't move so much and if you have a three mirror you can always see the peripheral retina as well especially in cases where you think there might be a peripheral retinal pathology but no indentation is possible and you have to rotate the lens to see all angles and that sometimes might be cumbersome whereas the posna or the zeiss the zeiss comes with a handle what we use routinely is the posna now if you see this this rests within the cornea or within the limbus so a very light touch is enough indentation is possible and at one go you can view all four angles so what does it do i want to do so let's look at that so i want to visualize the anterior chamber angle you can have either a goldman or an indentation to do it i need to assess the anterior chamber angle when it appears narrow with a van herit typically grade 2 or less and i need to see whether there's apposition or synoptic closure so this i cannot do with a goldman but an indentation allows me to do that but the rest the historical evidence of angle closure to note the iris near vascularization ss recession etc basically to look at the angle i can use either of them so what are the other issues one is sometimes there's a pressure on the larger bases or uh, base of the lenses can lead to compression over the schwa base area and this might result in narrowing underneath the area of compression so if you press it too hard especially for a beginner you might artifactually narrow an angle which is actually open and then misclassify it whereas the opposite is true for indentation if you press on with an indentation less uh, lens you can artifactually open up an angle which is actually narrow and localized corneal compression will cause fluid displacement again misclassification so this is just to show the application of the goldman three mirror one of my favorite pictures of this three year old girl so just to tell you that if this little girl can allow me to use the gonio lens without moving too much you just have the patient look down press the gonio lens on the lower margin tilt it up and place the lens on the cornea so it's easy to do initially but for taking pictures and for teaching again the goldman and this is an unedited 15 second video and i thank this to dr fazal and manik for doing this for me manik just stood with his phone and this is dr fazal just doing the gonioscopy and this is exactly how long it takes so it doesn't take any time at all in the clinic but for everyday gonioscopy we found that a zeiss or posner floor mirror this is actually a picture through the center of the gonio lens which we took on the eye cap so you can visualize all four angles together no coupling required and no indent and the indentation is possible now why do you need indentation why are we going on with this the main thing is if you see this angle now if iridotrabecular contact is present you don't know whether it's just opposing it or has it stuck and one pressure this is the same i you can see the desmet folds a little bit of pressure and it opens up and no amount of imaging can tell you whether it is appositional or uh, synoptic inclusion similarly you can diagnose plateau iris which is so important especially say if your pressures didn't come down with a with an iridotomy you just indent it a little bit and dr tam showed beautiful pictures of how it just drapes over a ciliary body knuckle which is pushing the iris up against the angle and then it forms a shallow valley and then it's down again and the same eye on the ubm shows you what a plateau iris is actually but you don't need it to do that so mix is on the horizon you must know direct gonioscopy also a lot of them are available but the swan jacob i think everybody um, uh, likes 
And this is how we do direct gonioscopy. So in case you need to buy a direct gonioscope, the microscope is tilted, the head is tilted so that again, this is the eye so that the light goes straight from the angle into the eye of the surgeon. And you need to rotate the microscope like that. So this is on, a, on the Zeiss microscope that we have. I'm sure all would have a rotating uh, thing. And uh, this, is a, this is a tilt, the head being tilted. And this is what we routinely do during EUAs. And the next thing you do is just put the uh, lens on the head. I think we don't have the lens picture. Okay. All right. So here it, here it is. You've seen the head tilted. And gently, you just put the lens on the cornea. And you see through the microscope. So there's nothing much in it, except that when you're doing surgery, you need to hold it in your non-dominant hand and do surgery with the other. So to conclude, it's an essential part. There's no glaucoma evaluation without it. It's well worth the little extra time. And frankly, any gonioscope is okay as long as you do the gonioscope. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sushmita, for those beautiful pictures and taking it from uh, zero to n. So that's very nice. So if, uh, but a, a chap comes up to you and says, I have only one uh, money to buy one gonioscope, which one will you say? A four mirror. Okay, perfect. Buy a four mirror. That yeah. is the answer for the PGs and the practitioners. But we request with folded hands that do buy a gonioscope. And if you're a PG, buy it the moment you join. Because like she told you, anything, but if you keep doing it, you will become so good and you need to become good at that. Uh, so I didn't, put in, I didn't put in the cost, but Indian gonioscopes are available for six or 7,000. So it's yeah, not and very one expensive. One, the yeah. book, et cetera, around 24 to 28,000, yes. but all of us can spend that much money. Yeah. Uh, that I know what else you can spend it on. <laughs> so we go on to Manish and Manish will explain to us uh, which machine to buy whether it's only the good ones, uh, the, the top ones, which are costing 13, 14 lakhs today, or it does the others can work for us. Uh, go ahead, Manish, please. So can you hear me and see yeah, the slides? Right. You can see the slides, make it full. Yeah, good. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Harsh, for inviting me to talk about this very important topic is which perimeter to buy. Unfortunately, that decision is not such a simple decision. and uh, usually this decision is taken by the administrators and uh, so it is a little complicated. So first of all, before you decide to come into the market, you have to know why you are buying a perimeter. So if you are an individual practitioner, just uh, having a small clinic, why do you need the perimeter? Are you just going to check patients and diagnose glaucoma and other conditions where there are defects in the visual field? or you want to have significant number of glaucoma patients who need follow-up tests and progression analysis, and you are going to manage them in a very, very scientific manner. So the whole key comes on to these glaucoma patients who need progression analysis. So how is this actually done by the machines? So I'm going to put it simply in the terms which an administrator can understand, not necessarily a glaucoma specialist. So what they do is they take a normal group of patients and who are tested, a group of say 100, 200 patients are tested and mean deviation is calculated. And anything which is two standard deviations away from the, the, the mean which they have calculated, they will label as abnormal. So this is a statistical abnormal. Does the statistical norm, abnormal carry on to glaucoma? Well, that is not that straightforward. And for many years, all perimeters used to do exactly this only. But then they have gone further and they have seen patients who have glaucoma, which is stable, tested them repeatedly, and then calculated the variation and standard deviation of those patients at various points. And when this variation goes outside the range, which is seen in the glaucoma patient, then there is given a p-value and a significant value. And therefore, the repeat tests are then compared to the baseline and previous follow-up visits to give you an event and a trained analysis. So this is what is being done for glaucoma patients. And this is the glaucoma progression analysis system. And it is similar in all the other more advanced perimeters. The strength of the perimeter lies in the size of the database. So basically, perimetry, the testing hardware itself is not such an expensive or a fancy thing. But 
It is how you put it through the tests, calibrate it, and give the data, put in the data into the machine so that the analysis comes out more useful. So you have to have a wide range of data, including racial, and that should be replicated in the testing conditions in your clinic to get the similar outcome. So definitely machines which have been more extensively used and tested and the data has been put in definitely carry an edge. Then there is other hardware which goes into the machine which makes the test more reliable. So there is fixation monitoring to make sure that the patient's eye is not roving here and there. There is gaze tracking which also does that. And there are shorter test duration uh, tests which are available which are smart because they have used uh, you know, analysis and data to make this test go faster. So there is CETA, CETA faster and TOPS, which is there in Octopus. And these tests are more intelligently designed using computer software to make the test time less. So I have made a practical classification called class one and class two. This is my own classification. So it is not that it is being made by somebody. So class one, what I call are perimeters, which have a very large database, which includes racial specific data as well. They have specific glaucoma progression data from a very big database of glaucoma patients, stable glaucoma patients, and has very good standardization. In addition, has short testing time strategies. The class two perimeters are the ones which have relatively small numbers. Many times, they, if you ask the question, when you go to buy the perimeter and ask them, what is the size of your database? How many patients were tested? Where they were tested? What was the classification? Were they glaucoma patients, normal patients, or general patients? They are not able to give you that data. When they are not able to answer your question reliably, that is a sign that their database is very small. They have stand. When you ask them, is there progression? All the machine vendors are going to tell you, yes, we have progression. But how is the progression done? It is done only in the statistical manner, where in the small database, and they have got, uh, they have tested the patients two, three times, calculated a standard deviation, and that's how they have done it. The standardization is not verifiable in this class of patients, and standard test strategies are there. But short test strategies are either not very good or they are not there at all. So if you are looking at a perimeter falling in this category, you should probably take opinions of maybe two or three people who are using that machine to know how good is their short test strategy and how good. So the class one perimeters are the ones which I mentioned in the first group are mainly the Humphrey Zeiss and the Octopus. And the class two perimeters, they have got many, but in India, the most common are the Appaswami, the Medmont, the Kova, and there are now many Chinese models also available. It is difficult to know all the names also, but there are many which have come into the market. So you have now the third class, which are not third class, but the class three, which are the new perimeters, which are virtual reality based. So it just doesn't have a machine. It just has a wear on thing, which you put onto your eye and it is linked to a smartphone. So these are the third kind of things available. What are the questions you are going to ask your vendor when you want to buy? Test algorithms, what are being used? The database I already mentioned, software of our progression I mentioned, time for the standard test I mentioned, and whether the short test duration programs are available and technology to improve reliability, what kind of things are there? The Zeiss perimeter, which is very popular, is a bold perimeter. The one, the thing is, it requires very important point, which I would like to point out to everybody. It requires regular service and calibration. Usually, needs a correction lens in the form of a wide aperture lens. The new model, which has come out, HFA three, has an inbuilt crystal lens. Now, you need a specific room, and low illumination is definitely preferable. Very necessary to have a service contract with that company; otherwise, you will not be able to run this perimeter. The HFA3, the new one, has got some new advances, auto pupil size, head tracking, the CETA faster, which is CETA faster 2C, 24-2C, which is really giving very, very short duration, liquid lens technology, where you don't need to put in an extra trial lens, and the real eye, which makes takes the image when the presentation of the stimulus and it checks fixation and the suspect area being tested. And it has a kinetic, custom kinetic technology as well. The octopus, on the other hand, is a projection perimeter, does not require a critical trial lens. Calibration is less critical. It auto-calibrates, 
and it can be done in normal light and pro progression it has got this polar plots which is a structure function correlation which nothing like that exists in size and it has newer technology pulsar for early diagnosis of glaucoma so if you compare the zeiss and the octobers this is a bowl this is a projection this needs very close maintenance much less maintenance here trial lens is required in all the other models only in the liquid lens crystal crystal model of hfe3 it is not required here no trial lens is required it does not have any structure correlation index in the octopus you have the polar coordinates which gives you structure co correlation to your functional perimetry and most often if you go for glaucoma tox most glaucoma tox and rct rcts is the humphrey and less commonly the octopus is being used by glaucoma specialists that does not say that it is not good for the glaucoma also the administrator would like to know if you need a separate room definitely it is indicated to have a separate room because visual field test is a subjective test and patient needs to be calm and not disturbed so if you have a separate room it is definitely better and then you want to decide finally in conclusion first know your aim do you want to have a vfa machine only to identify disease and complete the list of equipment available to you or you really want to go into the nitty gritties and manage glaucoma in a scientific manner and then know your budget not only the initial budget but also your maintenance budget as i mentioned there is a difference to scientifically manage glaucoma clinic you require a class 1 just to disease, detect disease even a class 2 or a vr based perimeters which are been doing very well are good enough thank you very much thank you manish i think that was beautifully summed up i think it is very very clear no pains no gains if you really want to do a good job you will have to spend the money uh, the but i will uh, add on because there may be a number of single practitioners who are listening then i i want to tell them out indoor model i went once to indoor and i asked then they said what we have done is that seven eight practitioners have got together and they have put in lesser amount of money but they were able to then come together and buy most of the machines so it is really uh, you have to think how to get the best for yourself and for your patient and that would be one very important model because manish has very clearly said and i really feel it this thing that he has forced us to now look for the best perimeters but obviously you can use strategies like combination with other people to use it so i'll go ahead and i will also like to tell you why uh, it is important for us uh, <coughs> to do a okay is the screen visible yeah manish are we good yeah yeah it's visible okay. very much uh, so what i wanted to tell you guys is that anterior segment photography is or even posterior segment photography again the same thing will come in because a lot of people say that uh, we can't buy it it is very expensive Uh, and like i already said in the beginning i may show some specific photographs here but i have no financial interest any with the finance involved in that is so little that i don't think anybody can imagine we have an interest in that but what i want to tell you please it makes so much difference to have uh, the things that i'll show you because possibly when we get a little older we really do not want to move from our slit lamp and uh, obviously if you have a junior resident with you you will say bhai ye photo leke aao but when you are not the one who will have any energy left to go and take a photograph somewhere else with the attachments and all so if you have something in by which you can take a photograph right over there just putting your phone and an attachment and this is one of the uh, photographs that i took with just my uh, phone and the attachment that i'll show you which costed only 2500 rupees and uh, you can see such beautiful even endothelial and desmet spheres have been recorded in this case and this was published in an international journal so you can do wonderful work with very simple things why is it important to document thing is because in today's world medico legal purposes it is very important almost 10% of my practice improved uh, because of impressing patient by showing them photograph 
one thing is to imagine and tell them in your words, but the moment you show them, oh, this is happening, and they'll be immediately uh, zapped that, oh God, I, I now know what he's talking about. And then definitely, if you want to take opinion, uh, like I keep sending these photographs to all these friends sitting over here and asking you, kya karna hai patient mein? So you can do that also. Plus, now with the era of telemedicine, which Ritika would be touching upon, this is a must. So we do know that we have these beautiful cameras and uh, the problem is the expense plus the room that they are going to take. Obviously, even the cheapest ones are costing around 2 lakhs and there is a lot of place. You have to go to a separate room and they are very, very sophisticated ones too. Yes, if you're rich, you can buy all those. And then there are digital compact cameras which have come up, which are much, much cheaper. But it is the smartphones. You can take a photograph with just the phone. Now you can see there's no attachment whatsoever. So this is one of my fellows who said, Sir, I like I'll just show you like that. So yes, you can take a reasonable photograph. But even better, my life was literally changed on that track by Dr. Jaitra, who had built up this very, very small contraption, but it works wonderfully well. So what you do is that you just apply this on any silicon cover of your phone. <coughs> and then you take out your uh, this uh, normal, uh, this thing, that case that you have, and you put the uh, phone in the next case. And the moment you do it, uh, you have a, we are sitting on a slit lamp. There is a sleeve which I have got permanently attached to one of my slit lamps. And you just <laughs> go on and put the, a phone with that attachment on this uh, slit lamp and it fixes up over there. So it is a two minute job because this is lying in a box near me. I don't have to move if a beautiful photograph is to be taken. <coughs> you must have a full round circle the way this is being shown. So you can just adjust it and then, then tighten it in a minute. And then you can see the type of photographs that you can get. You can see a beautiful valve over here in the posterior segment. You can see the depth of the chamber. You can see the flare even. You can see retroillumination. You can see the cataract and you can show to the patient that yes, you can take that photograph, show to the patient that cataract is developing. Uh, this patient asked me, where is the, you said that sclera has been applied. Where is the sclera? So, the moment immediately I took the photo, showed him this is where the sclera is applied in your uh, valve. And you can even take an angle photograph. So it is indeed very, very good. And I am not promoting this chat. There are a number of other things uh, like universal mobile slit lamp adapter, in which is not costing much, just 8,000. And you can really put any kind of a uh, mobile in this. And then again, you can do it with your slit lamp. Same with the fundus camera. Very, very sophisticated cameras are available. and uh, <clears throat> But simpler cameras which are developed in our country only can take wonderful photographs. And you just have to look at these which can even take peripheral photographs. Very, very simple contraptions. So look for them. Use them because they are inexpensive. Your mobile uh, phone can be used on the slit lamp. And you can just print out the photographs from that. And it, it's really wonderful to work on that. Thank you for your kind attention. So anybody has any question on that? It was wonderful, Harsh. Uh, so are you using it regularly? I'm using and, it and, regularly. It's and so why your, your patient is asked, where is the sclera? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Because in the in the uh, this thing there is one of the charge sheets. It was written that with a uh, sclera this thing or without this thing. So he, <laughs> he is asking me where is the sclera. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so people are very very confused. So now we are on. But uh, I must say that really you know it is so easy to just immediately put it on the thing and take a photograph. And the photographs are so good you can. You can publish your papers because we are all getting a little tired of going to here and there and many a times we don't have our residents with us. So let's go on and uh, Prateep who is our expert with imaging devices will tell us which, when and how, which one should we buy as far as the imaging device is concerned for practice. Go ahead Prateep please. Thank you Harsh uh, for opportunity. Good afternoon everybody. 
I would be talking on biggest imaging we should buy. So the first question comes, you know, on a lighter note, yes, if your pockets are deep, if your competitor has got one, and R, if you have a good practice and you have a retina colleague and a entry segment person with you, then yes, definitely you should have one imaging device. Now let us talk uh, seriously that what is glaucoma? Still the gold standard definition of glaucoma is a classic optic neuropathy which suggests glaucoma and correlating visual field changes. So where is the place for the imaging technology? Obviously, still in the standard definition of glaucoma, there is no place for the imaging technology. If you are doing a glaucoma practice, if you want to diagnose a glaucoma, then what all you need to do? You have to check the IOP. It is must. You have to do the gonioscopy. It is must. The ONH and the RNFL examination. Yes, you have to do that. Functional test. Manish has already described. Yes, we have to do the perimetry. Imaging, yes, that is a question mark. You have to do the monitoring of the progression. So for that, either it could be a ONH and RNFL, or it could be a functional test, or it could be a magic. So that we have to debate that which one is the best and which one suits you best for your practice. So what the WGA consensus statement says about the perimetry. The perimetry is an indispensable tool for documentation and monitoring of the glaucoma. Remember one thing. The indispensable tool. So obviously there is no substitute of perimetry for documentation of glaucoma and for assessing the progression of glaucoma or monitoring the progression of glaucoma. Look at here, the GP analysis. That you know, over a period of time, how rapidly this patient has progressed. The perimetry will not only tell us that how rapidly the patient is progressing, but if you will not modify your treatment strategy, then there, where this patient will go three years from now. And look at this patient, 10 years of follow-up, so many perimetry done, and there is no progression of glaucoma suspect. So obviously you, you are relieved. So obviously, yes, the perimetry is the gold standard, but the disc photograph also, yes, we take for every patient. Why so? What the WGA consensus statement says about the ONH photography? The photography in particular is useful for detecting and documenting the optic this hemorrhage and the rim color. Remember one thing, the structural damage precedes the functional damage, but the disc hemorrhage precedes the structural damage. And this disc hemorrhage neither can be picked up by the imaging technology, nor can be picked up by the perimeter. You have to take the disc photograph. So again, the disc photography also becomes an indispensable tool if you want to document all these changes. Yes, you can assess the progression by doing the disc photography. You can see that, you know, if this photograph was taken five years apart and you can see that the patient has developed a significant pattern. Yes, the pillar can be noticed. The pillar can be noticed. You can see that the disc has enlarged vertically. But what is the problem over here? You cannot assess or quantify the progression and you cannot monitor the progression by quantification. At, at what rate uh, the disease is progressing. Now let us see that what the WGA consensus statement says about the OCT. The OCT may be the best currently available digital imaging instrument for detecting and taking the optic now. Remember this OCT word. The HRD and the GTX has not come over here in the consensus statement. The macular RGC loss in the glaucoma can be detected by the OCT and the RNFL thickness and the macular RGC loss are complementary. Nowadays, the macular loss is becoming more and more important in assessing the defect of glaucoma and the progression of glaucoma. Why so? Because almost 40 to 50% of the pinglion cells are there in this macular area. So this GCC is very, very important and very critical. And apart from that, the OCT gives us so many information as well. There are lots of pitfalls regarding the perimetry and all of us are familiar that, you know, it's, most of the time it's very difficult to perform. In my practice, almost 50% of the patients, they are not able to perform the perimetry well on first examination 
and almost 30 percent of patients they are not able to perform well on repeated examination and some of the patients they feel it's kind of a punishment for them and they start living and and says that oh doctor sir again you are doing a going to do the spirometry today so the oct is helpful in at least in these kind of patient and yes you get lots of uh, you know information on that so obviously there is a quest for objective reproducible with high sensitivity specificity test which can detect early glaucomatous defect and the progression and the answer is imaging and there are so many devices available the oct hrt and the gth and obviously the hrt and gth there is no question of buying that because the manufacturer they are not manufacturing anymore if you are buying a second hand device then also don't do that because it won't be service Amongst the OCT, the time domain is already out. The four-year or HD or SD, yes, it's, it's the standard uh, machine which everyone buys. The swept source, yes, it captures more than one lakh forty thousand, more than one lakh twenty thousand pictures. And uh, um, uh, still, you know, I don't think that you know the segmentation might be slightly better. But still, if you have a SD or four-year domain OCT. It suffices the purpose. The NGO OCT is the new things. And even I am getting a little familiar with that. I I I have not used in my practice much. OCT is a versatile machine. It has a retina module, cornea module, and the glaucoma module. And thus, it is a good for the assessing the progression. This is by the GCC, and you can say that over a period of time, the patient has progressed significantly. And yes, by doing the ONS and the RNFL analysis, we can assess the progression as well. It is a tomogram as well, not a very good tomogram, but yes, it gives all the information about the rim area, the disc area, the average CD ratio, the vertical CD ratio, which is important, and the top volume as well, and compare the right eye with the left eye. There are not many other uses as well. If your patient is on PG analog and and vision has dropped, you can do the OCT and find that yes, or oh, there is a PG analog induced macular edema. Hepatitis macularopathy can be assessed. And yes, uh, if it's all green and it's still you suspect a glaucoma and you do the OCT, oh, you will see that oh, what is this is this is a, there is a so there are lot many problems with the OCTs. There are so many artifacts with OCT. OCT is not full to machine. And remember this last thing: the defect only when seventeen percent of ganglion cells are died. So the the perimetry, when the 40% and the OCT also 17%. There are so many OCTs are available. Zeiss, Topcon, uh, the Heidelberg Spectralis, the RTView, OptiView. There are so many OCTs and there is a good agreement among all these machines. Though the RNFL thickness is a little different. Uh, but yes, there is a good agreement among all these OCTs. And the NG OCT, as I have already said, I have used only for a few months. So I don't have much experience about that. But to conclude, I can say that the expense, it's a very expensive machine. Institutional practice or good practice, yes, you have to have this. The least expensive of all OCT is the RTV. The, uh, the NGO OCT and the uh, SEP source OCT are still evolving. Then buy an older generation of the second hand if you feel that it is must in your practice. So thank you very much for it, your patience hearing. Thank you, Pratip. I think that was very, very clearly done. Uh, but like what Manish said for those machines, uh, how many OCTs are there in market and would you follow the same pattern that Manish said about checking their database or things like that? Uh, how exactly would you go about buying it? Suppose, is it again like you have to go for the top models or can you go for lesser models? Uh, yeah, as as I as I as I said that you know most of the OCTs they have a good agreement amongst themselves. There is no problem. Now, as far as the pricing is concerned, the Spectralis is the most expensive one. The Zeiss uh, Angioplex 6000 is the most expensive one. It's almost 1.5 crore rupees. Unimaginable. But yes, if you go for the OptiView, uh, RTView, then it is least expensive. Uh, you can buy in 25, 30 lakh rupees. But it is better. And you go to the company if you want to buy and if you have less money, then you go to the company people and you say that, oh, you, do, do you have any, uh, you know, uh, which you have purchased in a buyback, have anyone uh, which you can, you can give me in a lesser price. So, yes, certainly, yes, probably, you know, the serious uh, 5,000 you can buy uh, maybe in around 40, 30 to 40 lakh rupees. 
RTV, maybe you can buy in 15 to 20 lakh rupees. So uh, you can buy a second hand or a used machine or maybe a demo machine uh, from the company people. They give with a good warranty. So the Spectralis and the, the size series is the most expensive one. Okay, so I think that is very in clearly told by Pratip that yes, you can go for lesser, but again, like Manish said, you ask some of the people who are already using it. And the other technique that Pratip has said is that you can go for second-hand machines definitely, which would be cheaper and may still be in very, very good condition. And you can actually use them and see them before you actually go ahead and buy them. Yeah, so, sometimes the demo machine comes for the sale and uh, they are in a good condition. And they give right. one-year warranty as well. Right. And it's almost, you know, two-thirds of the cost of the new machine. So, so that is a very good idea. I think this, this idea, is, this is really something that you can cherish. And uh, very nicely told Pratip. And let's go on now. Uh, and Dr. Parul is there, who will tell us how exactly to keep getting the patients back by having a good database, how to keep those records, how to be able to communicate with the patient, which is very important to get them back and also even legally now. Go ahead, Parul. Uh, thank you, sir. So before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to add as a solo practitioner, I would say that, you know, OCT is one of the machines in which every penny spent is, you know, returned very quickly. So I think you should not hesitate even if you're buying it for 30 lakh, 40 lakh. I mean, it, money comes back very quickly. So one can go ahead and because buy the, it. Because of the injections? Uh, so oh. you, can, uh, you can see the cornea, you can plan for a refractive surgery, you can do a lot of many things, you know. So, okay, good. So, so, so if, if you are a solo practitioner and having just a glaucoma practice, then it is not worth Yes, I don't think there's any solo practitioner with only glaucoma practice. I have not heard of some that <laughs> yes, yes, Absolutely, sir. So I'll. I'll Evander used to do only glaucoma. And that's why he only does the glaucoma practice. <laughs> I'll share my screen. Is my uh, presentation visible, sir? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Harsh, and thank you, AIOS, for giving me this opportunity. And we have heard that whenever we are planning to set up a glaucoma practice, what all do we need to buy? We need to buy a gonioscope, applination tonometer, the perimeter, and maybe we can think about buying an OCT. But most important thing is that once we have diagnosed the patients have glaucoma, how do we maintain their records and ensure that they come for regular follow-ups? So we all know that the glaucoma is a long-term disease and diagnosis is just the beginning of never-ending battle. We require frequent follow-ups to prevent the progression in glaucoma-related blindness. Therefore, maintaining records is very, very essential, and especially in today's era, it is very important to keep ourselves medically legally safe. So what um, uh, we can have different scenarios. So for example, we were talking about if one wants to establish a standalone practice with just basic instruments like an application and a 90D and a gonioscope, and you are referring your patients for a visual field and imaging to some other centers, then there is an option that you know you keep you tell the patient to keep all the records and you don't keep any. In such a scenario, if patient loses any records, then they are lost forever. And reprinting a visual field and OCT may be a challenge. And again, this could be a medical legal problem for the doctor. Research obviously is not possible. And once the records are lost, you can't even make out what were the initial pressures were and what were the disk looked like. So it's always a good idea to keep a set with you, whether you want to keep it in a paper form or electronic form, it's your choice. If you maintain a paper-based record file, they are very easy to read and you can allot a number and every time a patient is coming back, you can take out the file. They are very good and very handy to use. You can you know, just flip through the papers and see. Uh, but what happens over a period of time, the records become very bulky and you need a space to store them. And if anything happens, the record is lost forever. So the easier option, if you don't have an electronic medical record system, is to take, like Dr. Harsh was mentioning, that smartphones are very handy. So they are very handy for uh, saving the information also. So you can take a picture of the prescription, maybe the OCT visual fields, and store them with the folder with patient's ID in your laptop and compile the data at the end of every week, maybe uh, in your hard disks. And then we have these wonderful scanning uh, system. I have been using this Medtrail. This is a very... A handy app which you can get for 12,000 rupees in a year and what it does it you know digitalizes your entire prescription you just have to pass through a scanner and what you get in a stored form so you can you know take out the data that 
what's happening to your patients, what medicines are you prescribing and how are they coming back for follow-up. So this is one of the very handy apps which one can uh, use. Now, if you have a standalone dedicated glaucoma practice where you have full diagnostic or if you're working in a multi-speciality hospital, I think you should go in for an electronic uh, medical record system. Again, we have options to choose from. You can have an offline system or an online system. The cost varies a lot. So you can have something which can be as cheap as 50,000 to maybe two to three lakh rupees, depending on the number of users. And it comes with the uh, yearly annual maintenance cost also. And you can also ask your vendor to incorporate all the machines like the, uh, the NCT, the visual fields and the imaging modalities with the extra cost. And then you can see all these uh, uh, on the single uh, platform on your laptop itself. So you have the online models like the Yara Go and the easy solutions and the offline models are Lakisoft and TCS. So this is how you see the visual field sitting in your room. You can see the visual field, see the OCT pictures and look at the clinical and you can just go through all the visits for which the patient has come. Uh, the only problem with EMR, you know, they have a learning curve and even, you know, I'm still staggering though I have bought the Netra software, but I am still very apprehensive that should be, I mean, I should totally switch to these EMRs or you know, there's a lot of resistance because I always feel that maybe they are more time consuming and will I be able to see the same number of patients which I was seeing beforehand and what are the significant benefits actually. And if uh, we are going to switch into EMRs, is the patient-doctor relationship, the chair time going to get affected because we'll be busy typing and doing such things. So there are my own reservations, but ultimately I think we all will have to go paperless and that's the way to go about because EMRs have a lot of advantages all the data can be seen at a single click and obviously for telemedicines and if you want to refer your patient somewhere, you can uh, easily transfer the data and medically legally you are always very, very safe. So once you have, uh, you know, uh, seen a patient, stored your records, the other important challenge which we face in our practice is how do we ensure that patient is coming back for regular follow-up. It is very important and as a part of our glaucoma, I mean, it's an important role that every glaucoma specialist has to play that educate all our patients, emphasize the importance that they really need to come back for follow-up. Sometimes you have patients who have visited, you know, five years back and they said, the virus is already and we don't know that we needed to come for regular follow-ups. So you have to emphasize that follow-ups are very, very important. And whenever they are visiting again to your mm -hmm. clinic, you can tell them that they can get the visual fields or OCT or disc photographs before they are seeing you so that the wait time can be reduced. Now, appointment systems, again, if you have a simple practice, it can patients can be told verbally, or you can write it in the file that you have to come back for a three after three months for follow-up. Usually, if you emphasize it again and again, patients remember to come back within four weeks of the desired period. Sometimes they visit when the medicine is getting over or if they develop any allergy or co-opular morbidity. But mostly if you have panel patients like CJs and EJs, if they are very diligent, they come back to you whenever their stock is over before they, you know, it gets, gets exhausted. So they come back for refilling their stock. So they, that's following up them is never a problem. Now, the better way would be to have an electronic appointment system. Now, believe me, it's very easy and not very expensive. You can get it incorporated in your website at an additional cost of around 20 to 30K, which is not, and it's worth it because every time patients take an appointment and you emphasize that whenever he's leaving your center, he books an appointment for the next visit so that he'll receive a reminder message maybe a week prior to the appointment and also on the day of appointment. And same uh, message is conveyed to you also. And that's how you can maintain a regular chain. Or if, if you're not buying a software, you can use for these available vendors like Practo, though I just dislike Practo because they are, you know, they sometimes steal away your data. So you have to be very, very careful with Practo. Now with artificial intelligence stepping in in almost every field of our life, it's going to be there in glaucoma also very soon. And I think the future would be that we have a single app and you carry all your uh, medical problems, your prescriptions, your follow-up schedules in your pocket. Uh, Bill's Institute has developed an app and I think Novartis was trying to develop an app in last AIOS. I was at their counter and they were saying that they are going to come up with the app. I don't know what happened to it because of the COVID, but the single app can tell you about your medicines, about the surgeries. You can put in your field data, your pressure data, and see the same things can be accessed by uh, your doctor as well. 
So I think the ideal would be to have a single platform which can be accessed from any source or any place, but it should maintain patient's confidentiality and it should display all the parameters. It should be able to give reminders to the patients to instill their drops and for appointments and tell us about the same. I think this is one of the important things that I think Dr. Ritika will be talking about it, that we should maintain all the records even if we are doing teleconsults. And I think in teleconsults, because glaucoma, we are not checking your checking pressures there's no way we can check pressure so we should always mention about need of in-person visit whenever we are doing teleconsults for our glaucoma patients thank you thank you parul that was wonderfully done i think we have got most of the answers and you very rightly pointed out it's not an easy thing to uh, develop or to handle or to practice because it takes so much time i'm really actually fed up of doing it though it is a necessity especially for those people uh, who have to uh, write papers and get the database in and let us hear Ritika because I, Ritika has spent a lot of time developing these things so maybe she can give us a little input on that as well but she primarily is going to tell us how to set up a teleconsult. Ritika please. Thank you sir. Uh, is my screen visible and am I audible? Yeah perfect. Thank you sir for this opportunity. Uh, I think we've spoken a lot about investments uh, with equipment. My topic is just about investing in teleconsult or uh, on a larger level, investing in an EMR. And that investment is that of mindset and not that of a monetary uh, investment. And uh, just taking you over our experience with teleconsult. First, do understand that numbers tell a story. India today has the maximum number of internet subscriptions after uh, China, 40% of our population has access to an internet. So even those who say that uh, we work in a charitable institute to those who work in a premium institute, we all have patients who have access to the internet. So they can reach us through WhatsApp, through apps and multiple other uh, ways. It, 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 a study has shown that the geo effect really is translating into 70% of the Indians making purchase decision through the mobile phone by next year. So what has brought about this change? Largely, this change has been in the making. And uh, through uh, companies like Amazon, et cetera, this consumer behavior has been really hammered in. But COVID-19 has brought this change to healthcare. According to the Harvard Business Review, healthcare is only the third of the least digitized service sectors. The only two sectors behind us are construction and agriculture. So COVID-19 has now hit healthcare. And this is what is making us go into the digital shift. 84% of the patients surveyed in the United States in the first wave said that they would want to have access to their doctor through teleconsults because we are going to face frequent lockdowns. This is going to be on off kind of a regime of lockdown across the country and across the world. So this is what healthcare is now from Healthcare 1.0, where you could build big institutions and people would travel across the country to reach that institution. We moved to healthcare 2.0, where there were readily accessible doctor-driven practices to healthcare 3.0, where the patient or the customer is now in charge and he will decide the way, the time uh, in which he or she wants to visit the doctor. And of course, healthcare 4.0, which will be the future, will, which will involve a lot of AI. So we have changes which are subtle, but which are real. For example, if you see the Center for Sight website, when we request a callback, the option is now no longer book an appointment. It also says book a teleconsult. I would recommend that for those of you who don't have access to a teleconsult through an EMR to log in to a, a log in to any of the teleconsult modules which have been provided here. You don't need to provide all your data to these people. Only the patients who wish to access you through teleconsult can be um, uh, visiting you through this portal and you can parallelly open your EMR. So I, it is Dr. Parul is right by saying, don't integrate, don't pass on your data. But what this does is uh, when you're using a separate platform, you know, all of us have actually been teleconsulting all our life. Numerous WhatsApp, phone calls, everything has happened, but we don't realize now that it is regulated and it is chargeable. So using a proper platform actually allows you to formalize the process, makes you uh, legally safer and allows you to bill the patient as well. Uh, the process basically should have an appointment so as to not disrupt your routine life in the clinic. The payment process can then be done. A history tracking and problem sharing 
can be done before the doctor steps in because it has been shown that teleconsult can take up to 20 minutes and a normal clinical examination sometimes takes us five. So you can um, spend less time by having an optometrist do the history taking, problem sharing and teaching the patient how to take photographs of the eye if required. Then of course the doctor comes in and has a video consult. You have to store the records of a teleconsult up to three years, much like an OPD. And that is why having an electronic platform is useful. The electronic platform also takes into account the regulatory requirement of digital signature, payment gateway, uh, having the patient recognition ID uh, in place, generating an e-prescription and a billing. So like uh, we all know that I, uh, as a practice, ophthalmology requires a lot of examination. So teleconsult has actually not been anything more than telecounseling. We've not been able to treat a patient through teleconsult. So we've all moved on now to what is called teleconsult phase two, wherein we try to do more and get more information through the electronic media. So we have this... Uh, uh, modality wherein you can project a vision chart and ask a patient to place it at a particular distance and you can get things like the uh, visual acuity, you can get color vision, you can get red, red desaturation, you can even look at the uh, patient's uh, gaze and project, eye, uh, project light and then look at a rough Hirschberg kind of a thing for alignment. So all these things add to certain detailing and allow you to make a diagnosis. Remember, you cannot prescribe medicines without making a diagnosis. But still, we are far from perfect. And now this is the model that is of the present. Uh, you see here, we, we, we launched home care services. Uh, these are services which allow uh, a vision technician to go to the patient's home and take from a fundus photograph to eye pressure to vision and refraction. This will give you enough data to treat a patient. Do note that Glaucoma is a chronic care practice. You not only have to acquire new patients, but you have to make sure that the patients keep funneling back. And a, an important way to make sure patients funnel back is to give them access in the way that they need. So we have this home care service where you, uh, the optometrist or ophthalmic technician goes home. He can, uh, this has been launched in Delhi. Uh, so he can uh, give you a good refraction. He even carries a uh, foropter and uh, a vision chart like this. Uh, these are small investment. The vision chart will cost barely 3000 rupees. And uh, you can do a good refraction. He even carries a spectacles with him. So if a patient wants to buy spectacles, that can also be done. A fundus camera. And for known glaucoma case patients who are unable to step out, even a portable perimetry, though may not be as uh, reliable as the real perimetry that you are using in the office, but this is still better than nothing. So, And uh, we also do the IOP. So this is really the assisted teleconsult model. This has been tried by Shankar Netrale, LVP, and us at Center for Sight. So this can work either through home care or through vision centers or through mobile vans or through a very simple tie-up with optometrists. There are numerous optometrists who check pressure and refraction routinely. And this is what Shankar Netrale did. They tied up with Titan I Plus across the country. So their patients had a neighborhood access to getting vision and refraction and pressure checked. Also, there are a lot of hospitals which want to refer to a glaucoma surgeon, an advanced case of glaucoma, but the patient is not willing to travel. Let us not discount the fact that our colleagues are the easiest way for us to teleconsult. They can give us the basic information. And then the glaucoma doctor can ask questions which can be fed by a non-glaucoma expert in terms of the answers so that the glaucoma expert can process and come up with a plan. These cross referrals from eye hospitals and optometrists are really a great way to leverage expertise for uh, very advanced cases who can't travel. Uh, moving on to the fact that yes, we have teleconsult, but we are not quite there. But my only request is that the patient's mindset has changed. He's willing to hop onto the platform. As a provider, we cannot delay our mindset change after that of the consumer. So even today, we are doing a dozen teleconsults in Delhi itself every single day, despite the lockdown way over. And uh, if data is a problem, yes, that may be a problem right now. It's definitely not going to be a problem in the future. You already have contact lenses that can monitor your eye pressure and send it to you longitudinally 80 times a day. We have devices being created in Aravind, which when you have an IOL being implanted, it will have a small sensor which will check your IOP automatically and send it to the doctor without a visit. And that will allow you longitudinal data. It will allow you to see what the pressure is when the patient wakes up, what the pressure is when the patient eats breakfast, et cetera, et cetera. The electronic IOL is also coming of age. 
which will have uh, IOP monitoring in it. And it will actually allow you to take photographs. If you blink, it's supposed to have a photograph captured. So it has multiple embedded devices. It can have lithium batteries. You have the Google glasses, which are there. These are all things which are actually being manufactured. And if you speak to AI manufacturers, they say in five years, your normal smartphone will have a fundus photography, will have a vision and possibly a refraction check. So the avail availability of data is going to come in really thick. I think it's time that we start unwrapping the future by stepping onto the teleconsult module. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ritika. Thank you. That was like Star Wars. But you really opened up our eyes, and we are a little bit scared that this is this is too this thing. Trishmita, uh, you have any word because you have a very good EMR system and things like that. Do you? Are you people doing uh, teleconsults in PGI? Yeah, yeah. We've been doing teleconsult from the last year itself, but the model is a little different. And uh, frankly, I think. Uh, We've done service by providing a lot of uh, work and employment also to primary and secondary um, uh, hospitals and practitioners where patients were not going and they're happy going there now. So this is, I was listening to a talk yesterday from M.V. Prasad and SN and they both said that it was eye-opening that the vision care centers had almost doubled or trebled their footfall, whereas the tertiary centers did not. So it's a good thing of COVID would be if we could sort of ramp up the primary and secondary care, which could then call in and tell us, look, this is something which I can't do, you need surgery, or this is a tiny baby I'm sending to you. But we stepped out of our routine intraocular pressures. Our teleconsults worked by the patient calls and we get a list and they have an hour to call and then the senior residents sit down all day till four o'clock and they call back. And the idea was all of you must have some sort of record of whatever eye examination you had and why you're teleconsulting. They could not teleconsult and say, Mary they had to teleconsult after visiting a local ophthalmologist. And that's what went across all departments. So it worked very well in that way. Okay, and Dini, we, I think it was nice. Uh, and I must thank all my uh, co chairs. It was really wonderful. It was eye opening some of these talks. And uh, we get to, uh, we hope to meet soon and uh, uh, more of these talks. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, Zubi, I hand it over back to you. Thank you. Thank you so 